Hey there, welcome again to another edition of Michigan's Auto Talk Podcast. Every episode of Michigan's Auto Talk Podcast is about celebrating the automobile, everything automotive. And, you know, we're also here to help and support you car and truck owners across our great state of Michigan, birthplace of, uh, birthplace of everything automotive. And by the way, speaking of you guys, car and truck lovers who listen to this podcast, uh, we want to encourage you to leave us a message at Facebook, facebook.com forward slash Michigan's Auto Talk. And most importantly, just stay in touch with us. Let us know. Reach out. You can call Verberg's Automotive. We're based in Grand Rapids, Michigan. We have listeners all over the country. Al Schwinkendorf is the host of Michigan's Auto Talk podcast for years on the radio in West Michigan. Uh, we gave John Puick this episode off. <laughs> and, um, yeah, you don't, you don't I, I mean, back in the day, you used to get calls at Verberg's all the time, right? Oh, I still do. You still do. But, um, so um, I'm Fred from uh, whatever, Detroit, and I'm in my 59 Corvette, and I'm at the Woodward Cruise. I can snap a pic and put it on our Facebook page, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and if you were at we the want. Metro Cruise, you know, Ali, we were, you were just talking about our friend Tom Norton at WKTV. They did, what, the Dream Wheels broadcast yep. at the we'll Metro Cruise? On. And we, we want to get uh, we, <laughs> we're going to get Tom on. We we both know Tom. We're gonna we're gonna get him chased down. But I saw I was about a hundred yards from where Tom was set up at Rogers Plaza. I don't know if you heard about Rogers Plaza last Saturday. It was nothing short of insane. It was the biggest crowd for Metro Cruise, and I've gone to several Metro Cruises. This was, I believe, the seventeenth annual. Yep. And this was the biggest freaking crowd I've ever seen. It was almost to the point of claustrophobic. I don't know how anybody <laughs> moved, but there were more cars at Rogers Plaza than I think I've ever seen gathered at any car show I've ever been to. Oh, good. It was insane. My, my MO usually is Friday night. You know, Cascade does a, a pre-cruise thing Thursday nights real close to the shop. I ignore that because if I go there, everybody wants me to go tune their carburetor and do whatever so yep. i blow that off typically friday night i will go home i'll take 28th street up to the belt line just to see what's going on what's cruising down the road and take the long way home and then saturday i'll do one run from cascade to the mcdonald's in granville turn around come back and call it a day um this year I went out to get uh uncle tom's mustang which uh he's moving Saturday, he's making his pilgrimage to California for six months. He's got a one owner 1967 Mustang 289 four barrel um, that he's looking to sell. Um, did some work on it, fixed the air conditioning, and he drove it home. And the temperature gauge ran warm, so I'm like, you know what? I'll come out Saturday morning. I'll take it to the shop. I'll put a new sending unit in it or the gauge, find out what's going on with that because I knew it wasn't running hot. I'll just take 28th Street to Kalamazoo and run out to Green Lake and drop it off. Well, I pick up the car, cruising good, going up Kalamazoo, hit 60th Street. It starts ticking and the oil pressure drops. Two and a half hours later, tow truck picks me up, runs me back to Green Lake to get my truck. We get to the shop about one o'clock and I was done. There was no cruise for me this year. Yeah, you didn't, I, I gotta tell you, I, I, I think it was um, it, it was a little too crazy, and it took us. Uh, I'm trying to think from Woodland Mall to get to Rogers Plaza, 50 minutes. That's 5:0, yep. yep. and that was just 28th Street. Because keep in mind, there's everybody out cruising 28th Street, and this was two o'clock in the afternoon. And the people who don't even know what's going on. <laughs> Plus every other dumb sucker who yep. doesn't know that the Metro cruise. And I saw somewhere on television, I think at Wood TV, they predicted 300,000 people uh, that they day. They started showing up like Wednesday because, you know, the um, Woodward cruise is always the weekend before. Yeah. And there's people that travel great distances to go to that. And they're like, we'll take a week's vacation. We'll drag our feet. We'll come back west, and then we'll go hit the Metro Cruise because it's getting that big, and then go home from there. And, and it was absolutely, totally insane. And um, I like cars. I like old cars. I get all that. But as I'm getting older, I'm getting a little crotchety. And I don't like the two-mile-an-hour on and off the brakes to go up and down and see what's going on like I used to. It's just not the same thrill anymore. 
Yeah, and after a while, I mean, it, it's fun to see cars, but I'm definitely, after Saturday, I, I'd say I'm definitely the smaller car show guy. And, you know, there's, again. And there's so many good ones in West Michigan. Yeah, and there's there's nothing wrong. Kudos to the folks in Wyoming who put on the Metro Cruise. It was an un qualified yep. success there's no question about it so in this episode we're going to focus on some serious recalls interesting to note and these are current recalls that you'll want to pay attention to very very many hundreds of thousands hyundais of hyundais and kias we'll talk about that and a whole bunch of audis that were recalled several models but interesting to note al and i just thought i'd have fun with you for just a moment because you you've been working on cars for 40 years Top three all-time recalls. In 1996, Ford paid up big time for, you remember the ignition switch fires? That yep. was, <laughs> this that was, was another huge. faulty ignition issue with the Bronco and the Explorer. Now, think how many Explorers were on the market well, by you know 1996. Well, was actually a brake light switch on the master cylinder. Yeah, that's right. They, they would catch fire. That one was huge. And then Ford got knocked again with the Explorer deal with the... Um, what were they Firestone tires? Oh yeah, that that was another one. Yeah, where they'd say they blow out and go. And the funny thing about that is, not only did Explorers get those, but um, Oldsmobile Bravadas. And at that in that point in time, we talked about Oldsmobiles in the past. Oldsmobiles were huge in West Michigan, and everybody loved those tires because they wore like iron and they lasted forever. But the problem was a lot of people were keeping them underinflated and running them well beyond their life, and they blow out on the highway. And while the Ford people were all happy because they got money back and they got new tires, the Oldsmobile owners were all mad because they loved them and they couldn't buy replacements just like them because they'd go, the tread would go 80,000 miles, but the carcass gave up at 60. (laughs) And that was a crazy deal. Yeah, indeed, indeed, indeed. Let's move on to the Hyundai. And by the way, that was the uh, that was the third. Uh, I want to finish the next two. That was 14 million Fords recalled, 1996. GM. The headline is a faulty ignition, many lies, 30 million GM cars. That was another faulty ignition switch. This time it was February 2014. Started with an 800,000 car recall, and that mushroom to 30 million GM vehicles. 30 million. Yeah, Chevy Cobalt, Malibu, all the Pontiac cars had an issue with torque and vibration, and then this was another issue. This time the power steering would go. There's all kinds of issues. Again, this is GM with a massive recall. The number one all-time recall, and everybody remembers this from fairly recently. It it was over the last 10 years. The (laughs) Takata airbags. Takata? 42 million vehicle recalls in all. And those, there were several, (laughs) several, I shouldn't laugh, several uh, lawsuits because several people were killed with exploding airbags. Takata basically could only do one thing, that was go bankrupt, and they did file for bankruptcy. Uh, The car companies ended up eating all the cost. Almost all top car makers, 50 in all, had uh it were impacted by the takata airbag recall so that i mean seriously if you think about that the gm was big at 30 million this was almost every automotive nameplate and 42 million cars so the hyundai and kia recall and and this al i see a ton of these vehicles they're good looking vehicles motor trend Love this. Oh, yeah. I think they got SUV of the year when the uh, best Palisade. Money, best uh, SUV for the money. Yeah. We got to go back one moment, though, to the Takata thing. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. You're from a tier one automotive supplier family. I might be, yes. No, you definitely are. <laughs> Tower Automotive was a tier one supplier. Okay. They supply based on a blueprint from a manufacturer. I'm just saying Takata's kind of got thrown under the bus here. They accepted, the manufacturers accepted and designed what they made. You know, low bidder gets the job. I'm not saying Takata was low bidder, but I'm just saying that, you know, they don't, they build what the people want. And in the automotive industry, if you don't provide exactly down to the specifications that I want, you don't get the contract. And they got the contract from multiple people 
who just followed the leader and said, yep, if it's good enough for GM, it's good enough for me over here at Volvo and BMW and on and on and stuff like that. And to this day, BMW has a bounty off as an independent shop to run every VIN. And if a car comes in and we find it has a Takata airbag in it, we're to report it for them and they're supposed to pay you money back. I don't deal with that. I just tell the customer to go see the dealer. But, um, you know, they got thrown under the bus. And it's amazing that they didn't, I mean, they did go bankrupt and stuff, but it's a serious thing and it got thrown on them and it wasn't, that wasn't very nice. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> Not nice at all. So Hyundai has, uh, has a pretty big issue on its hand, 245,000 Hyundai Palisades plus uh, 3,600, 36,000 Kia Thousand. Tellurides. So it's a, it's a pretty major number, almost 300,000 vehicles. Here's the thing I didn't know, and I'd like you to kind of help me and our listeners understand this. I think a lot of people think Hyundai and Kia are different nameplates. And technically they are, but they also, from what I understand, share a lot of components. So is it one company or is it kind of two companies, but a lot of sharing? It's one company. It's like you can get a Honda or you can get an Acura. Right. You can get a Nissan or you can get an Infiniti. You can get a Toyota or you can get a Lexus. Right. You can get a Ford or you can get a Lincoln. You can get a Chevrolet or a Cadillac. It's that kind of deal. Like when you're ordering parts and stuff like that, they'll change up numbers. But the the two vehicles you're talking about are basically the same thing. It's like when we used to have Plymouth and Dodge where <clears throat> something would go down the line. The first three would be Aspens and the next four would be Volaris. It's, you know, it's like that. Yeah. So uh, real quickly, though, is is Hyundai, just like Lexus is the luxury, Toyota is the, you know, the, the standard yes. everyday vehicle. Is Hyundai considered the high end, Kia the low Hyundai end? Hyundai is the high end above Kia, yes. Okay. I never knew that. And I think yep. a lot of our listeners just learned that. I, that's what I figured. But, again, that was one of those things. You, and, and they do look a lot alike, but they look different enough. If you, yep. Yep. If you look at a Palisade and a Telluride next to each other, there are some subtle differences. But this is a recall. You know what? They do a better job than most of hiding that. You, you were absolutely and, right. Yeah. And um, both those companies, you know, I had a guy... A customer who was a dentist and this is like 85 86 and he went to Chicago to buy I think at the time we didn't have Kia's we had Hyundai's and he'd buy these little Hyundai's because he was a dentist and he had a practice in Grand Rapids a practice south of Wayland and a practice like in Greenville and he put on a buttload of miles I mean this guy would put on like 50,000 miles a year more than most truck drivers and he'd buy those things and he would drive them and we'd put tires on them and change the oil and replace belts and brakes and he'd run them like 250,000 miles and get rid of them and it, it, we didn't do anything to them they were absolutely amazing however you must remember that times have changed now but when they started they had the newest production facilities in the world Ford, General Motors, BMW, Porsche, Audi, they've all like retooled um, their facilities to make the newer cars. The Koreans started from scratch in the late 80s, which gave them a heads up on everybody else. I mean, they, they, they weren't taking the old stuff and finding out the cheapest way to make the new stuff with the old machinery. They started from scratch. And they're still... Um, extremely good cars and they used to be the most car for the money prices have come up and you know they're competing with toyota and subaru and stuff like that right now they're not the bargain that they once were but um they're still very good cars and we have very little problems with them except for the the thefts you've heard about that right yes we have the kia boys we could do a whole whole episode on that well this one is from a a printed circuit board part of the tow hitch assembly and this is pretty interesting listen to this that basically moisture other junk gets in there causes the boards to corrode can cause a fire short circuit etc and in fact there was a period of time and i don't know if this is still the advice they were advising kia telluride and hyundai palisade owners to park their vehicles outside away from the house because of that fire risk. Here's the Just thing, like though. Just like the Chevy Volts. Not everybody has a tow hitch. 
Not all right. those vehicles have a tow hitch, but in this case, Kia and Hyundai are being extra cautious, so they recalled every model just to check them out. The other one that is under a recall is Audi, and this is much smaller. This is, you ready for this? We just talked about Takata exploding airbags, yeah. about 1,200 uh, this is a, a, not the Takata airbag recall. This is different. This is about 1,200 U.S. Audi and VW vehicles. But here's the deal. A whole bunch of vehicles impacted. This is the 2016 model year. There are a lot of these vehicles on the road. The Audi A3, the Cabriolet, the A3 e-tron, the A3 sedan, the R8, not very many of those on no, the road. Not very many of those. The S3 sedan, the TT Coupe. You see a few of those every now and then. The yep. TT Roadster, the Volkswagen e-Golf. I have never seen an e-Golf. We see a ton of Golfs. I don't think we even have them in North America, maybe in Canada. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, it says they're in the U.S., but there are not many in Michigan. The Golf GTI, the Golf R, and the Golf Sport Wagon, the Reason for the large spread, they were made with passenger airbag inflators made in the same production batch as the affected vehicle. So basically, the airbag inflator of the Audi A3 is in a lot of of those other VW and other Audi cars. So that is, a uh, again, a a pretty, I would say, for the number of Audi drivers in that year, that is a pretty extensive recall, even though it's a relatively smaller number. So we moved from recalls. Al, you've got some automotive history and uh, really kind of a, a tease that we're going to be doing an episode on the, uh, these guys could have had a soap opera written about their life, the Chevrolet brothers. I don't know how many people know that Chevrolet was actually named after a guy named Chevrolet. I think a lot of people would be surprised about that. There were three brothers. They were actually um, Swiss. Everybody thinks they're French. They moved from Switzerland to France, Canada, and then America. And they got their start um, actually building racing parts for Ford engines, which I find hilarious, but it is what it is. Um, Yeah, so we're going to talk about them on a future episode because it's you know kind of like talking about re olds and stuff like that that is michigan's automotive history to a t mm-hmm. um things that went down in august alejandro di tomaso who i love because he he owned uh, moto guzzi motorcycles which i've owned several of and totally enjoyed um in 1975 he purchased this Maserati from Citron. Maserati is what it is today because of Alejandro Di Tommaso. In uh, 1967, Chevrolet made his first Camaro. That's worth noting. That surprises me. I had no idea it was that late. Yeah, 67, okay. 68, 69 was the first gen Camaro. Okay. Um, in uh, 1908, Henry brought out the first Model T. I think it replaced the N. And that was his most famous, you know, vehicle that ran on until, what, 26 or 20, 27. It was a big hit. In 1902, Fred Wankel was born. He made the rotary engine, which why it's not more widely used today than it ever has been, I don't know. But, you know, that was a big kick for him. 1984, John DeLorean went to court for selling that Coke to pay for them DeLoreans. <laughs> Didn't work out well, but he got off with it. We know that in 1897, R.E. Olds formed the Oldsmobile Motor Vehicle Company. We heard about that in the past. In 1958, Maria Teresa de Phillips became the first female Formula One driver, which is pretty impressive. It 1958. is. 1958. Yeah, that's quite a long time ago. A lot of people they probably aren't aware of that. in the pits back then, women weren't, but she drove a, Maserati, a factory Maserati 250F in the Portuguese Grand Prix and did pretty good. Yeah, I'll bet. Well, that, my friends, is going to put the wraps on this episode. We'll have some more trivia for you next time, more auto uh, history, if you will. And uh, we are hoping to connect with the Henry Ford Museum. Some really interesting cars, part of a new collection there, including, are you ready for this? The classic Ferrari in Ferris Bueller's Day Off, which, as we all know, ended up in the Chicago River somehow got towed out of the river and well you know the rest of the story if you don't you need to watch ferris bueller's day off again it's just (laughs) i do that about every six months it's just one of those great great vehicles that ends up being 
uh, in a very pivotal part of uh, the movie. We'll just leave it at that. All right, that's going to put the wraps on this episode, which happens to be episode number 72 of Michigan's Auto Talk podcast. You can find Al Schwinkendorf and John Puick at Verberg's Automotive in Cascade. And, of course, you can find the podcast and everything we do and some interesting notes about automotive history, including a recent post about Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, the actual Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. You can check that out. Um, we had something up on the Oscar Mayer Wienermobile. There have been, did you know there had been that many versions of the Wienermobile, Al? Have, Dude, I've got the app. You've got the app. <laughs> there, no, my daughter and I have been once a year, and we haven't yet this year, but, you know, after the Cherry Festival, they move around, and they usually hit West Michigan in the fall, but we have gone and got wiener whistles every year for, like, the last 10 years. I got the app, and when they're close, you know, it's Sunday morning, and it's just like, ooh, the Granville d is having a wiener mobile from 10 to 3. We head out there, take pictures, get the wiener whistle, Sometimes the they call them. Uh, I'm trying to think who they call the the kids that run that. The daughters. Okay. They even have a thing where you go inside the store and you go hit the condiment section and you find a card that they've hid and you bring it back and they give you a prize and stuff like that. Yeah, I love the Wiener Mobile. It was at the Metro Cruise. I think it was around seven or eight years ago. It may have even been longer than yeah, that. So it was. Uh, just a little bit of fun trivia. All right, that puts the wraps on episode 72. Be sure, like we said, check us out on Facebook. Uh, like this episode. Share our episodes with a friend. We are wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. Until next time, for John Puick, I'm Phil Tower. I'm Al Schwinkendorf. We'll catch you again real soon.